Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Ever since Darwin, about 150 years ago, published his famous book, The Origin of Species, we've sought our nature in our evolutionary history with the other animals. And increasingly, as we find out more about genetics, we are told about genes we share with other animals. And, and over the last few years, many of you have been reminded that you really just jumped up chimpanzees, that you share over 98% of your gene sequences with chimpanzees. But I want to pose a completely different answer to the question of what makes us human, and that's that we have acquired uh, a suite of psychological, emotional, and social instincts from our long evolutionary history of living in small tribal societies that we recognize as our cultures. And those cultures are unique to humans. They're responsible for our unparalleled adaptability and prosperity around the world. And we'll see that they have really sculpted us, body and soul. And indeed, they've created in us a very bizarre sort of dual moral nature that only we have. And that nature is something that we, with some resistance, can recognize in all of us, that we are kind and cooperative and generous and in unsurpassed ways on the one hand, but we're capable of extreme cruelty and violence on the other hand. And these are tendencies that inhere in all of us. We want to understand where that dual moral nature comes from. And it will turn out that we can unite those two, as unpleasant as it might be, we can unite those two as the suite of traits we have acquired for advancing our tribal societies around the world, which has been a way of advancing our own, it turns out, survival and reproductive success. A lot of this stems from something we'll call the human capacity for culture. And it's going to be an elusive concept, but we'll try our best to understand it. And to do so, we have to go all the way back to um, these 98.5% similar creatures to us, the chimpanzees. And we're often told that these chimpanzees are very intelligent creatures. And we point to the fact that they use tools. And yet, what I want to call your attention to here is they were really intelligent. They wouldn't be using sticks to get termites out of the ground, and they wouldn't be using rocks to crack open nuts. They'd be using a shovel to shovel the termites out. And if they were like us, they'd just go to a shop and buy a bag of nuts that somebody had shelled for them. So this really isn't evidence of great intelligence. The reason this isn't intelligence is that we could probably go away for a million years, come back, and these chimpanzees would be doing the same thing. Now, if they really were intelligent like us, they might have figured out a new way of getting termites out of the ground or cracking open nuts with rocks. But it seems that they don't. And the reason that they don't is it seems that they don't really get the idea of what these other individuals are doing. Rather, it seems to be the case that chimpanzees, seeing other chimpanzees doing these things, are drawn to play with sticks and rocks. And just by chance, they might crack open a nut or they might fish a termite out of the ground. And that reinforcement is enough to get them to do this behavior. Homo erectus was an upright ape that lived on the African savanna beginning about 2 million years ago. And it lived for about two million years. And they made these beautiful hand axes. But if you go to the fossil record over that two million years or so that they lived on the African savanna, they made the same hand axe over and over again with no improvements, no real variety in these hand axes. It's as if they didn't really get the idea that they were making something that they could modify or improve. It's even the case that the Neanderthals, these animals now that we're told were over 99% similar to us in their gene sequences. They spent 300,000 years living in Europe. And sure enough, they had a toolkit that was a little bit more sophisticated than Homo erectus. But that toolkit also didn't change for 300,000 years or so. And so we have this phrase, uh, monkey see, monkey do. But the irony is, it seems to be the case that monkey see, monkey mostly cannot do because they don't actually specifically imitate or copy behaviors so much as have their attention drawn to things that they might do. And then they fiddle around and, as I said, by accident, perhaps reinvent their culture every generation rather than building on things that others have, have developed. 
we have something that psychologists and anthropologists have called social learning. Very difficult to define, but what it seems to translate into is that if I see you making a hand axe, I sort of get what you're doing. And I'm thinking about this idea of a hand axe and, oh, what's it for and how could I improve upon it? And most specifically, I can look at some hand axes and say they're better than other hand axes and it's this one that really works that I'm going to retain. And so you can see there's a sort of Darwinian natural selective process going on in our cultures. So what we see in our societies in contrast to any other thing that's called culture around the world is this cumulative cultural evolution or cumulative cultural adaptation. And that's responsible for absolutely everything around us in our everyday world. And it's what distinguishes us from all the other animals. All other animals on Earth are confined to the habitats that their genes adapt them to because they don't adapt at the cultural level. They don't have cumulative cultural adaptation. And so Homo erectus were found in one part of Africa. Homo neanderthalensis, we think they're very bright and they might have even had language. They were confined to a small region of Eurasia. And that's because their genes adapted them to this environment or to this environment, but their cultures couldn't adapt because they didn't really have culture. Sometime around 160 to 200,000 years ago, this mysterious thing happened. This human capacity for culture arose, and then this species spread out around the world, able to occupy every habitat on Earth, from the Arctic to living on water in the marshes to living in the middle of deserts, and that was because this species could adapt at the cultural level. So the Dinka tribesmen here, they average six feet tall, and their bodies are a living adaptation to giving off heat, because that's what you've got to do when you live in that dry region. This woman here who's carrying this stuff on her back, she lives above 12,000 feet, and she carries a gene that allows her to breathe at that high altitude. And so our cultures took us around the world by adapting and developing the wisdom, technology, and skills, and then our bodies responded at the genetic level. And this is why we've been able to occupy the world. Our cultural groups were units of survival. The wisdom and the, and the technology that resided in people's minds kept you alive. So this was something worth preserving and something worth fighting for. Our psychology has evolved to protect our cultural groups by cooperating with individuals within them and competing with individuals outside of our groups. This is an adaptation we have evolved for protecting these very valuable cooperative societies that are, have been part of our evolutionary past. And this can explain some very peculiar features of our nature, this dual moral nature that we have. So for example, we know that we're oddly and peculiarly group focused as a species. It's not unlike us to wear matching sort of silly shirts when we go to sporting events. We even paint our faces in the colors of our national flag, almost subsuming our identity to our group. We're capable of extraordinary and sublime acts of coordinated group activity, as you might expect of a tribal society that had to work together to survive. And we seem to have a peculiar joy that we derive when our coordinated group activity results in the vanquishing of some foe. Now, in addition to this lovely side of our nature, this cooperative, altruistic, and helpful side of our nature, we know sadly and disturbingly that we are wary of strangers and prone to parochial attitudes, hostility towards outsiders, and xenophobia. And this is exactly what we would expect of a species that has evolved in these little tribal societies competing with other tribal societies looking for the same resources as them. And so we are prone to this xenophobia. We know that we can treat other members of our species crudely and violently, even other members of our own societies, when we think that they threaten the integrity of our group. All right, which side wins? That's the, the real worry. Well, we have some hope in that we have been, we know, tamed by culture in some way that we all understand tens, hundreds of thousands of us can mingle side by side. We have learned somehow to get along with people. Now imagine if this were 
100,000 dogs or 100,000 baboons. Imagine the chaos that would be. So it's a part of our nature that we can do this. And so scenes like this are becoming commonplace in the world. As we move into the modern world, our cultural nature gives us hope that we can solve what will be perhaps the most pressing problem socially of the 21st century, which is the mass movement of people around the world from less salubrious regions into more prosperous regions. And we know that one of the most pressing social issues of our time is this issue of migration. And hidden beneath the surface of that word, of course, is this idea of xenophobia. And we don't like strangers. We don't like immigrants and so on. And yet we can ask ourselves, is there any reason to believe that this psychology I've been telling you about, this, this social psychology of our species, will somehow win out? Think about it. We're the only species that has worked out the psychology of cooperating with individuals we're not related to. Cooperation can normally win out over endless cycles of betrayal and revenge because there's always a, a sort of seduction of competition and killing your enemy because then you get to occupy those lands. But you have to live with the fear that that enemy might be trying to kill you. And so it seems to be an in inexorable part of our history that cooperation has had greater returns than competition. Supranational organizations like the European Union they're always creaking and groaning, aren't they? Because the entities in them are still competitors. But somehow they've realized that by putting down their arms, as it were, and cooperating, there's greater returns than, as I say, these endless cycles of betrayal and revenge. And so I think we can take away a hopeful picture of our future. And it ironically comes out of this dual moral nature that was part of our tribal evolution. In the book, you use words like uh, a discovery of this this capacity for culture and uh, for mm -hmm. you know, technology, or um, we invented this 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 ability um, after actually a period from say 100,000 years ago to about 70,000 years where things were relatively static. There suddenly was this this incredible explosion which we see in the archaeological record. Mm. Can you explain a little bit more about how how why there was this sudden shift? What do we know about that shift, mm. and, and what is it that caused it, and that hasn't happened with other species that happened uniquely with ours? Nobody knows what the answer is. But we can point to behaviors. And, and one is that we seem to have this capability to, to, to imitate or copy very precisely new or novel behaviors. Now, the chimpanzees that I showed you with their, you know, their anting or their, you know, getting termites with sticks and, and, and the rocks and so on, um, that's something that's sort of hardwired into them anyway. Uh, chimpanzees play with things all the time. They manipulate things. And so this is a behavior that they sort of do anyway. But what humans can do is we can ride bicycles, we can do ballet, we can sing opera, and we can copy and imitate these new or novel behaviors. And we seem to be able to do so with a, with a sort of fidelity of transmission. You know, you do something and I copy it that is much better than we would expect by simply having our attention called to some object. If I use a paintbrush in front of a chimpanzee, the chimpanzee will probably pick up the brush, because they can pick up things, right? And they'll go like this, and they'll paint. But if I walk away, the chimpanzee will just sit there going like this. And if they make something really nice, some beautiful kind of abstract image, they'll just keep on going, right? Whereas if we were painting, we'd sort of get the idea that you're painting to make an image. And if we made something nice, we'd mm. stop. These two things seem to separate us from the other animals, so that their behaviors tend to be repetitive and they rediscover, as I said, every generation their culture mm. simply by sort of trial and error, whereas we build on what's gone on in the past. As a civilization, given the pressures we face today, mm. is there some way in which we can use this understanding of this dual nature of our mm. um, cooperative, culturally oriented um, predisposition to kind of help to us to make this transition to the kind of densely populated yeah. Um, complex world that we live in, um, or we're going to be just w subject to whatever forces of cultural evolution t take us? We have this nature, this culturally sculpted nature that is ruthless in its appetite for doing things that <coughs> promote our survival and prosperity. And we've, we've all come to accept over the last 20 or 30 years that our genes evolved in this way that promotes our selfish instincts to survive and prosper. 
culture is a Darwinian system that we have been selecting with our minds, and we have selected culture to do the same thing, to promote our survival and reproductive success. And that's why we've populated the entire world. We have left excess offspring, excess genes, everywhere we've gone. And so we shouldn't expect automatically that that nature is going to see us without strife into the 21st century as we combine and blend you know, people from all over the world. The only species on Earth that has the psychology that could overcome the, the, the sort of you know, xenophobia and wariness of strangers that we have is, is humans. And we've realized that the returns from cooperation can exceed, not always, but they can exceed the returns from competition. And you can see it's just playing out all the time. If we can get away with it and vanquish our foes and wipe them off the face of the earth, we do so. But when we reach a stalemate, we try to form these cooperative links. And things like the European Union are, you can see, struggling right now with the notion that should we bail out Greece? Nobody wants to because it's Greece after all. But we realize that if we don't, we're all going to go down. And so there's nothing noble about it, but we get ourselves into these cooperative groupings and then once we're all in the same boat, we have to cooperate to survive and prosper. And so I think, uh, without trying to be glib, our best hope for the future is to create greater and greater inter interdependence mm. among everyone in the world so that whenever somebody takes a wrong move or a competitive move, it hurts everyone. So let's encourage China to invest heavily in all of these countries because then if these countries go down, China's investments go down.